Hey everybody, back in the locker room again uh, with a different topic today. Um, we've been talking a lot about uh, cytokines and in particular uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and particularly in relationship to the COVID-19 virus and the fact that people aren't really dying from this viral load, they're dying from these cytokine storms that uh, put us uh, into shock uh, and uh, create organ failure and ultimately uh, death. Um, and one of those uh, organs that is, is severely compromised in COVID-19 infections is the lungs where you go into an acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, it's a, it, it, a compilation uh, of events, the viral load, the attack uh, on the virus when it's attached to the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, uh, two receptors, um, and uh, in the, that in an, the immune attack there causes tissue damage, uh, but also that the, the cytokines are facilitating that, that uh, level of immunity at that point in the, uh, in the fight and that the, the cytokines also cause leaky membranes so the bigger white cells can get out and go attack the uh, virus, but that also leads to leaky uh, membranes and the lungs filling up with fluid and becoming uh, congested. And we've also talked about the role of angiotensin II, uh, highly inflammatory uh, 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 chemical that causes vasoconstriction of our blood vessels that is downregulated by this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptor that the virus has attacked so we have too much uh, inflammation in our blood vessels and other organs that have a lot of ACE2 uh, 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 receptor sites such as the uh, the bulbs in the nose that our sense of smell and our tongue uh, has a lot sense of taste and we also have those uh, receptors uh, on other organs uh, uh, including uh, the heart and and um, the kidneys and, and even our ovaries and testes so we we've gone through uh, quite a bit in terms of, of the uh, inflammatory actions of this COVID-19 uh, infection, primarily mediated by the pro-inflammatory cytokines, but this cousin of theirs, angiotensin II, plays a, a part in that. So uh, that's covering a lot of this ground around pro-inflammatory cytokines and how they integrate with the immune response and stimulate the immune response, as well as how they are um, highly inflammatory and by their name pro-inflammatory that we keep referring to uh, we get very focused on those two things in fact uh, their ability to uh, attract white blood cells is how they uh, got their name so cyto meaning cell and kind meaning movement to be able to move white blood cells to a, a, a place where the body uh, is being attacked, uh, maybe a bite from a tiger with bacteria or a virus in the lungs, uh, is how they got their name. So, but they do so much more than just activate the immune response and, and create inflammation. Uh, the, the cytokines are directly involved in, uh, in hormonal function and directly involved in metabolic function and they're directly involved in uh, neurologic function and neurotransmission and they're directly involved and in not just in our physical health but in our mental health and they affect our behavior. So they, they are a, a massive communicating system throughout the body that actually has allowed us to come to the conclusion that our neurologic system, our endocrinologic system, our uh, immunologic system, our psychological system, and even our sociologic systems uh, are all uh, mediated um, um, at best and maybe, maybe just influenced by in terms of the, uh, the, our social uh, uh, connections. But, uh, are very involved in, in who we are and how we feel and what we do.
Um, so anyway, that's kind of a long story, but uh, today I want to elaborate a little bit on some of the metabolic activities that the, that the cytokines uh, affect. And, and again, we're going to be dealing with these pro-inflammatory cytokines primarily uh, that come out when we're under threat, when we're under attack. Um, uh, in, in the dis discussion today, but I want to again remind you that I'm talking more about how they influence metabolism than inflammation. And I also want to point out that uh, we have the pro-inflammatory cytokines, we also have their, their counterparts, the anti-inflammatory cytokines uh, that make us metabolize things in a certain way and feel a certain way and tend to be very uh, healing and restorative and they come out when we're feeling safe in the world and because I, I recoil at just looking at these things that integrate with, that are inflammatory or non-inflammatory and integrate with the immune system selectively because of sort of their global nature and how they act in the body. Uh, a few sessions back, um, I decided to rename them. Also, because there's a whole bunch of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and they come in the forms of interferons and uh, uh, um, interleukins and tissue necrosing factor and adipokines and all kinds of stuff and there's a whole bunch of anti-inflammatory cytokines as well. So given the quantity of them and not wanting to talk about each one every time uh, and the fact that they don't just deal with inflammation and activate immunity, uh, we had thrown out the terms threogens for the ones that come out under threat and create that environment in our body. And then we had also talked about this idea of safeogens, the anti-inflammatory ones that come out when we're feeling safe and secure. Uh, and, uh, and what they, they do, what they generate uh, in our body and our physiology. Um, so we won't probably go into too much of that. Uh, here today, I want to mainly talk about uh, metabolism and so, sort of the, you know, as we call it, the global uh, cytokine theory of safety and threat, uh, using that and polyvagal uh, uh, concepts to, uh, to, to look at what, what we're doing metabolically uh, as we're negotiating a, uh, a threat or an attack. So let's go to the board. Um, and uh, uh, we, we cover this almost every time of the different threats. I think it's really important to, to continue to recognize that we have multiple physical threats uh, in the world. Um, you know, toxins, uh, molds, uh, uh, parasites, bacteria, viruses, COVID-19, lions, tigers, bears, other people, um, motor vehicles, whatever. There, there are a lot of, of uh, things that can threaten us, attack us, and and not only uh, hurt us, but harm us uh, in, in, in terms of uh, um, our, our physical being. And, and probably this whole system really developed because that was our biggest threat in primitive times, is, this, is our, our, our threat to our, our, our physical self. Um, but what we found is that we've co-opted that same system uh, that comes out when we're under uh, spiritual threat as well. Um, so, you know, we've talked about uh, that uh, you can suffer an emotional attack, you can suffer sort of a, a, a social attack, being um, uh, uh, dismissed um, uh, and denigrated uh, in a social standpoint, elevates pro-inflammatory cytokines, just like getting a bacterial infection. Um, and even, you know, a financial uh, uh, threat uh, it can... Uh, also create uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then we always want to remember the, the stuff that we tend not to be very aware of down in our subconscious, below consciousness. Um, there are things that, that run down there that can make us feel threatened and stimulate this threat response and the secretion of pro-inflammatory cytokines. We have predictive codes in our brain. Some of very few in humans uh, are are actually instinctive, but we do have a few instincts in there. Um, but most of it is, is based on our history. We create predictive codes and then we search our environment for signs of safety and threat. And so those are running. Also, we can have traumatic memories that are housed down in the subconscious of our brain and kind of poke at us and not allow us to completely find safety. Always feel slightly threatened in the world 
And then we've talked about suppressing thoughts and suppressing uh, emotions and that energy uh, gets housed unless we really deal, deal with that. It, it perpetuates a threat response even when the threat's uh, been uh, effectively eliminated um, and that can poke at us and cause increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, so we're talking about uh, threat again today. Again, uh, the, the three agents as a big group of uh, cytokines are the threat cytokines, and we're going to talk a little bit of them under the concepts of polyvagal theory and then this idea of global cytokine theory. So let's turn over here and kind of just look at metabolic pathways. I don't want to dig into this too much. Um, I just want to give some, some concepts and, and propose some things to think about. So when we're in fight or flight, um, our, our fuel choice, we have a fuel choice in, in that mode and it's glucose. So glucose is uh, a sugar and in our bodies, any sugars that we take in, um, uh, you know, um, simple carbohydrates would qualify as sugars like breads and pancakes and things like that. So, uh, uh, but also sucrose and uh, corn syrup, fructose and all that kind of stuff. Eventually, when we actually want to use that for energy, our body converts all of those things uh, uh, to glucose, and that's what we burn. So uh, when you take and combine uh, some oxygen, in this case, with glucose, it's going to go down this pathway. I mean, we've got uh, this sort of spin-off effect uh, where uh, we create uh, ATP and carbon dioxide. And ATP, these uh, jacked-up... Uh, 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 Chemicals actually are the things that deliver energy to our cells. So the the you know, the glucose uh, pathway uh, is what we rely on initially in fight and flight. And we have some glucose stored uh, in our muscles, and we have um, um, uh, uh, bonded glucose and glycogen stores in our muscles. But that doesn't last us very long in the fight. That gets us going. But now we've got to have a delivery system to, you know, to our muscles and our heart and diaphragm, you know, uh, to, to keep, keep us going in the fight. So ultimately, uh, we have to perform a function of glycolysis, which is breaking down this, these, uh, uh, these, these bonded uh, uh, glucose uh, uh, chemicals uh, to individual glucose. So glycolysis is taking glycogen, which is stored in the liver and stored in our muscles, and breaking it down to glucose. So that, that's fuel. So that can keep, keep us going for a while as well. But ultimately, when our circulating glucose starts to fall and our glycogen stores are being depleted, we have to do something else uh, to get fuel to sustain uh, the fight or flight. And so that process is called gluconeogenesis. Gluco meaning glucose, neo meaning new, genesis meaning create new. So we're creating new glucose basically. And how that process occurs is we start breaking down our other tissues to try to form uh, some, some glucose to keep the, the fight and flight going. So uh, lipolysis is the breakdown of our, our, our stored fat, right? So um, when we break down uh, the stored uh, fat, it, um, it, it, it actually mobilizes out into the body uh, in, in, in our bloodstream in terms of our lipoproteins, which most people are kind of familiar with this concept of lipoproteins because that's you know so we talk about our good and bad cholesterol so we have you know our high density lipoproteins which we think are really good for us and then we have our low density lipoproteins which we think aren't so good for us and our very low density lipoproteins so what happens um, to fat under the influence of increasing cytokine uh, levels is the, the cytokines start to uh, cause lipolysis and break down the fat because our body is predicting we're going to need more energy. And the cytokines are the mechanism by which we start to break down our, our, our fats. So um, our high-density lipoproteins are hard to access for fuel. They're packed in there, right? And so we start creating these lower-density uh, 
um, uh, 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 structures um, mediated by the cytokines so, that, so we have better access to them for fuel. So we start breaking down high density lipoprotein into these lower density ones and eventually even to smaller ones uh, so that the cells can uh, uh, use them for fuel. And eventually um, the, the, the fat that's carried around, we should probably mention the lipoproteins um, are really there to transport cholesterol and triglycerides or transport our fats through our blood to get it to where we can use it. So, and because oil or fat is not soluble in water or blood, uh, we have to sort of create this, this structure that allows it to emulsify in the blood so it can be delivered, right? So those are the lipoproteins. Half of them are sticking in the fat and the proteinaceous part are out where they can be emulsified in the blood to be delivered. But anyway, eventually we get to the point where we break these down into uh, our fats down into glycerol and fatty acids. So when we are in uh, uh, fight and flight mode, we're gonna take that glycerol up and, and it can be put into the gluconeogenesis pathway and can be converted to uh, glucose, okay? Um, so, and then similarly, we're gonna start breaking down some protein tissues. So that's, you know, that's like muscle and stuff. Uh, to use it for, for fuel, and certain amino acids, so amino acids, when you clump them together, they create peptides, which clump together and create proteins. So certain amino acids are relatively easy to uh, put into the gluconeogenesis pathway and create more glucose. So we can continue to, to uh, uh, have enough fuel for the fight or flight, without having to stop at McDonald's and, you know, and get something to eat so we can keep going. So that's kind of our, our strategy there. Now, we talk a lot about um, these pro-inflammatory cytokines in COVID when they start to go on this upturn, when they start to aggressively climb, um, when they get to a certain threshold, we end up uh, going into freeze and, and faint uh, physiology. And we've talked historically about the fuel, the innate fuel strategy for our body in freeze and faint physiology is no longer glucose. Uh, the, the innate physiologic strategy for fuel in freeze and faint is ketones, okay? So as those, as those, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines are rising, such as in a cytokine storm in a COVID patient, but uh, uh, it, you know, in, in general, as those are rising, and perhaps we're, we're, we're really not keeping up with the fuel demand uh, for glucose to keep the fight and flight going, or perhaps we're losing the fight, or we're fearful we're gonna lose the fight, or we're actually getting our butt kicked. Um, so, you know, we, we are going to shift our physiology based on lack of enough glucose, but also lack of being able to win the fight. Uh, and we will switch our physiology into freezer faint physiology, a surrender physiology, an immobilization physiology, a relatively low metabolic rate physiology, where we start dropping cellular activity. We stop. We start. Uh, we stop making neurotransmitters, we stop making hormones, our blood pressure falls, our heart rate falls, our temperature falls. So when we get to that stage and freeze or faint, all of a sudden uh, our preferred pathway is now to take uh, you know, the fatty acids down uh, and we can also take um, the, uh, the glycerol down and we can take some specific amino acids and funnel them down and into a, the ketogenesis pathway where we're creating ketones and ketone bodies uh, that we can use for fuel. So that's um, acetoacetate, acetone, and, and uh, butyrate are our ketone bodies. And, and we talked about how uh, these are acceptable sources of fuel for, for our body and particularly our brains, but uh, they, they also have um, protective uh, qualities to them because the ketones um, push back uh, 
against the pro-inflammatory cytokine. So it's almost, it's a feedback loop, right? The, the pro-inflammatory cytokines get too high, we go into freeze and faint, our fuel source then uh, becomes ketones, and all of a sudden the ketones come out and they squash the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines. So we talked about this, this might be very important in managing a COVID-19 uh, uh, infection when, when, uh, when we are starting to crash. That, in fact, we've had concerns that if we give people glucose when their innate physiology wants to be more in uh, a, a freeze and faint uh, point, um, or if we give them glucocorticosteroids, which um, you know kind of cause gluconeogenesis, uh, that we aren't going to get that anti-inflammatory effect of the ketones, and we are going to per perpetuate the inflammation and the, the pro-inflammatory cytokine storm and actually contribute to poorer outcomes and potentially somebody's death. So that's all pretty interesting right there. Um, and uh, I'll just put up here just so it's not confusing. We have NADH, uh, that's uh, 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 nicotinamide uh, adenine dinucleotide. So uh, this is the, the upper half of, uh, of what's being spun off, as you can see with, uh, with oxygen and glucose. You, uh, you're going to uh, create a high energy uh, phosphate bond here, ATP, that's going to be used for energy and uh, a hydrogen attaches to this thing, which is kind of a, a B vitamin thing actually, and uh, the carbon and the O2 combine down here and we breathe out the CO2 in the fight. Um, so let's, anyway, we can move on, move on from that. I, that's just kind of uh, interesting stuff. So let's come over here and, and talk about some of the stuff we were just reviewing, is that with, uh, as the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines are climbing, uh, we, um, can, we, we see this, this, this shift in our, in our physiology where we're down here in fight and we're using glucose and stored uh, glycogen that eventually gets broken down to glucose. As we get into uh, flight, and fight is a relatively short duration phenomenon, we can't sustain fight that long. So as we turn to, to flight and start to flee, and um, and now we you know we may be on the go for quite a while, uh, we're going to be still burning glucose. We're trying to supply our muscles with glucose to keep it going. We're breaking down our glycogen, and we're going to lose those glycogen stores relatively rapidly. So they're not so much available to us. And so now we are dependent on this process of gluconeogenesis, which involves breaking down proteins or proteolysis for amino acids that then can be converted to glucose and, and breaking down our fats through lipolysis and conversion to glycerol and fatty acids that can, uh, the glycerol can be converted into gluconeogenesis, right? So uh, then we get into a point where we're getting exhausted and we're gonna move into our, our um, oh, I'm sorry, I got these backwards. Let's put this here as freeze. And let's do this one here as faint. So as we go into freeze, we're gonna start converting uh, uh, more to the utilization of ketones. Um, so we're gonna break down fat and we're gonna push them into that other pathway, to that key, ketogenesis pathway, and we're gonna break down protein and we're gonna push certain amino acids into the ketogenesis pathway. We're still probably burning a little bit of glucose in, in that freeze phase, okay? Um, uh, Eventually, we're going to get more exhausted and provided we're not stopping to eat simple carbs. For example, if your dog has been attacked and it curls up, you know, in, under the desk for a day and doesn't eat anything, uh, you're not going to have a lot of glucose production. And, and as you get more and more sort of, sort of fainty and collapsed and dissociative, 
you're not going to uh, be able to go out and get glucose. So you are going to, um, up here in faint, rely solely on uh, ketones. Okay. Now, as we've talked about before, ketones are protective. They're protective because they cause the pro-inflammatory cytokines to take a dive. Okay, so we stop the storm essentially with using uh, 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 ketogenic uh, strategies, right? So they're also protective for our neurons. So even though we might be in a very low metabolic state and a low um, blood pressure state, low heart rate state, low perfusion state, low oxygenation state, uh, our neurons are actually going to be relatively stable if we allow that, if we give them you know, enough, uh, uh, enough fats and, and amino acids to continue to have an energy stores, source, even though it's ketones, they'll do quite well in that low perfusion, low oxygenation, low metabolic state. Uh, the ketones are protective of them, right? They're also protective of the, the glial cells, the supporting cells uh, in the brain. And in fact, they also protect uh, our, our muscle cells, both uh, the cardiac muscles and the skeletal muscles, okay? So, um, so we don't need to be afraid of being a little freezy and fainty because that may be uh, an acceptable physiology uh, for survival. And as we've noted in past talks, is viral replication, and actually most cancer cell replication, is highly dependent on glucose for its, uh, for its uh, mechanical pathways. Now the virus hijacks our own cells, our own uh, pathways in our cells, but a viral replication tends to need glucose as a fuel source. And a lot of cancer cells cannot metabolize ketones. So they're dependent on sugar, they're dependent on glucose to perpetuate themselves. Um, so um, uh, not only are this, uh, is this state of ketosis or burning ketones protective for many of our tissues, it also can be seen as um, as an antiviral and an anti-cancer strategy. So in, in our antiviral medications, uh, they, that's a, essentially what they're doing is they're just trying to prevent the replication process of the virus. And we have an, uh, our own endogenous, innate uh, strategy for doing that, which is converting to ketone metabolism and not allowing um, uh, the mechanics of the cell to have glucose so that, so that uh, many of these viruses can replicate. So that, that's really important and really cool. Um, now the other thing I want to talk about because I don't think we have this right, okay? So this is, this is getting into, uh, you know, cytokine theory kind of stuff, but I think it d does deserve consideration. We go back over here to this process of of lipolysis and the deliver delivery of um, our, our fats uh, uh, to, uh, to the cells. Um, we have talked about high density lipoprotein and low density lipoprotein and very low density lipoprotein, okay? So the way we learn things in school was that high density lipoproteins are um, are the good, and technically we call them the good cholesterol, because in, inside of this uh, lipoprotein we're, we're carrying uh, tri, triglycerides and, and cholesterol. So we've said a high density lipoprotein is uh, the good lipoprotein or the good cholesterol. It's anti-inflammatory and it is um, non-atherogenic or it doesn't create clots and uh, placking in our arteries. You know, it doesn't clog up our arteries. In fact, it helps to clean out the arteries. And, and that's kind of true because what high density uh, lipoprotein tends to do is um, go around the body and, and, and collect uh, fat, collect the fats, store them in high density compartment, um, but also then like even deliver them to the liver for further uh, storage and that and that type of thing, okay. 
So, um, so we can we can uh, talk about when does that occur? Well, when we are able to store these fats and not steal them from our cells uh, for uh, you know for an energy source is when we are safe in the world, right? When uh, we are not under threat, we're not anticipating fight or flight, uh, and we have a good uh, uh, fuel source, we have a good food source, uh, and, uh, and, and so we can, we can uh, uh, move these into more of a storage mode, a packed in mode, right? Okay, but if we're under threat and our body is anticipating needing fuel for the fight and the flight, then, then what do we do? Well, then we need to mobilize this, these, these, uh, these fats for fuel. And not only do we start to mobilize them, but we, uh, we store them differently. We put them into less dense storage uh, in LDLs, VDLs, and, and, and APOE so that they're now circulating in the blood and really accessible uh, for, uh, for fuel. So I think my point here is I think we have to consider the possibility that we don't have good and bad lipoproteins or good and bad cholesterol. We don't have anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory cholesterol. We don't have uh, uh, lipoproteins that go around the body and clean up uh, the clogs, uh, so to speak. Uh, and, and, and we don't necessarily have uh, the a low density or, or the lower density lipoproteins that go around and just naturally get stuck in, um, in, these, uh, uh, in these plaques on our artery walls, right? If we're under threat and, uh, and we have a uh, vascular injury, we're gonna swoop in there and platelets are gonna aggregate to protect that injury, so we don't bleed to death, all right? We're gonna activate our coagulation pathway, so we're gonna have a lot of uh, coagulation of the blood around that area, and we have to repair that area. So, you know, fibrinogen comes in and we get uh, fibrin formation and fibroblasts and collagen being laid down, and we create essentially a scab, and it, things get caught up in that scab, and under threat, what's circulating in the blood are the lower density lipoproteins. So they do get stuck in there. Now, if we had that, uh, you know, same, same scenario uh, with a lot of HDL circulating in the blood, it's certainly possible the HDL might get stuck in uh, the, uh, the clot. But by and large, if you have a vascular injury, that's a threat, and you're going to see more of this stuff. So let's say... Um, we go back to spiritual injuries, right? Let's say if you are living in isolation, you're poor, you're discriminated against, you suffered injustices, uh, and you have elevated uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines from that, what is your lipid profile going to look like? It's going to look like the red and not the purple. But let's say you're happy, healthy, you know, you don't have a care in the world, things are well taken care of uh, for you, uh, you're not under threat, um, arguably you're going to have a lot of HDLs, right? Um, so the big question to ask here is could all these lipoproteins all these storage houses for uh, cholesterol, triglycerides, that type of thing, could they all be absolutely neutral? Have absolutely nothing to do with whether or not you uh, end up with vascular disease or not. And I contend that's probably the case. What is the determinant of uh, whether or not we have vascular disease or not, or other diseases, we've talked about this, is whether you have pro-inflammatory cytokines circulating around. If you're under threat and you have pro-inflammatory cytokines, they are pro-inflammatory. These guys probably aren't, right? 
they are pro-inflammatory and they are going to create uh, some of the phenomenon if they circulate chronically that we see in terms of uh, uh, vascular disease. Whereas if you are safe and you have anti-inflammatory cytokines circulating around in, in, in your blood and there's no need to be decompacting to being creating less dense lipoproteins because you don't need the fuel for the fight uh, then you're going to see a lot of HDLs and your blood vessels are probably going to be uh, pretty clean uh, and I think that is uh, you know that is a, is, a, is an extension uh, of the cytokine theory into uh, uh, another aspect of, of uh, the metabolic uh, pathway. So, and I will reference back, we, ha we did a quick discussion on obesity and type 2 diabetes, and just remember in that uh, talk we identified the fact that um, our fat cells do throw out pro-inflammatory cytokines, so if you're obese, you are going to be throwing out pro-inflammatory cytokines, just like you're under any of these other threats, uh, and your lipid profile is going to be more like the red guys than the purple uh, guy, right? Um, and we also talked about the pro-inflammatory cytokines as, as a strategic advantage create insulin resistance, because when you're running from the tiger, the last thing you want when you need every one of these little glucose guys for energy to, to fight or flee the tiger, the last thing you want is uh, glucose going into fat cells and, and, uh, and being uh, uh, converted. So, so those fat cells under the influence of pro-inflammatory cytokines will not take up glucose. They will be passive to glucose and that's insulin resistance. But also as we gain more weight, those fat cells say, mm, no more storage going on here and they produce these pro-inflammatory cytokines that then they become insulin resistant um, to that and it starts and so obesity because of the production of pro-inflammatory cytokines creates insulin resistance but it also creates all of the sequelae of chronic threat including uh, a change in uh, uh, in your uh, lipid profile. So uh, I always like to say, just because we see two things occurring together, we can't always make uh, you know assumption that one's leading to the other because sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes it's bi-directional; they influence each other. Um, but it, but we have to be very careful that when we take a snapshot of our body, of the physiology of our body at any given time, and we see something present, we can't conflate it or uh, create a misattribution of it. And I do worry that we've made a misattribution of these lipoproteins as actually being uh, significant uh, in, uh, in the creation of disease uh, when they are uh, metabolic strategies within our body uh, mediated by our cytokine profile and it is in fact our cytokine uh, profile that is determining uh, our physiology and with chronic elevation and pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, determining not only our poor physical health but our poor mental health and that usually leads to poor relationships and uh, and uh, social uh, illness as well. Um, so with that, um, I think we can uh, kind of shut it down, but I, I always you know, like to bring it back to this idea of, of, of threat and what chronic threat uh, does in our body versus being uh, safe. And I've said uh, many times at the end of these, and I will repeat it again, given what we know, if we take all of this stuff on the board and just reduce it down to the fact that um, it's really threat versus safety. And if we're under any threat for any of these reasons, we're gonna have illness. Threat is, chronic threat is illness, period, okay? Uh, but if, we're, if we feel safe, fully seen, and secure in the world, we're gonna be healthy we're going to feel well. And so, whenever we see people inducing threat in the world, 
we should be questioning that because um, it's so costly, not just to individuals, but to the society as a whole, to the globe as a whole. Um, we have to constantly be looking at how can we make not only ourselves feel safe in this world, but how can we make other people feel safe in the world as well? Because then we'll have wellness, we'll have health, we'll have all the riches uh, that we need if we have our health. Um, and I've referenced this before. I don't know who said it. Maybe I made it up. Uh, but, but um, you know, a quote, as somebody said, um, uh, no man can be free until every man is free. And I need to find out who said that. But I, I like to uh, kind of turn, uh, do a turn on that one and just say, uh, you know, um, with this idea of, of safety, no man can be safe until every man is safe. It's the same thing. And we're seeing that play out today. I mean, between COVID-19 and George uh, Floyd and all the other black men who have had this, this same atrocity uh, perpetuated on, on, on them, it affects all of us. It may affect us in different ways, but each one of us, by the toxicity of, of having people have to live under chronic threat, we become affected by it, right? When there's, uh, you know, being an old white guy, when there's rioting in the street, well, that's, that is uh, dis destabilizing uh, for me. I totally understand it um, uh, and why it is happening. Um, but the threat that we um, put on are minority communities, right? We don't, it comes back, the chickens come home to roost, right? It's going to come back to the people who are denying them uh, their uh, God-given rights that are perpetuating threat in their world. To what advantage, right? It's insanity. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, all of this biochemical stuff just comes right back uh, to really uh, the very fundamental of how we treat each other in the world. Um, and we don't need to be creating, you know, uh, another glucophage or another statin um, or another antiviral. We don't, that's not what we need to focus on. We need to focus on uh, taking care of each other and making sure we all feel safe in this world. And if we do that, we're gonna be absolutely Fine. Uh, thank you.